Welcome friends to this second day of our three-day event to celebrate the Bandara of Great Master Hadur Maharaj Baba Sawan Singh Ji. I'm very happy to see all of you again here. I mentioned yesterday that I will talk to you later about light and sound. The reason why I said that is because the teaching of this great master is often referred to as Surta Shabda Yoga. Surta Shabda Yoga means putting attention on the sound. Surta means attention, Shabda means sound, and Yoga means union with your true self. So that is why the yoga itself is called Surta Shabda Yoga. It's necessary to understand what is the role of sound and maybe light. And at some point in our experiences, we'll find out that sound and light internally are the same. Externally, they are different. Externally, sound travels only in a medium like air. But internally, it is like radio waves and can travel even without air. So there's a difference. Sound exists everywhere. There is no place where there is no sound. Nobody has ever experienced complete stillness with no sound. There was a Japanese meditator whom I met in Japan. He said he had built a cubicle made of glass, soundproof glass, that he could sit inside and have complete stillness and no sound. He invited me to come and examine it. It was about 20 miles outside of Tokyo, where he had his sort of an ashram. I went there. They sat in that little glass globe that he had produced and I could hear my heartbeat like I never heard before. <laughs> I could hear my breathing like I never heard before. The more still you get, you hear so many sounds. Apart from the breathing and the heart, there are many other gurgling sounds which we don't realize, we don't notice. There is so much sound around us. And then scientists have now come up with a new discovery that everything in this world is moving, mostly in a circular motion. That everything is rotating. Our building blocks of all matter, which are atoms, have electrons spinning around the nucleus. They also found out now that the spin of the electron around the neutron, nu nuclear is causing a humming sound. They have recorded the sound. Even the smallest particle is generating a sound. The other bigger bodies, like in galaxies and so on, they are generating a sound which has sometimes been heard even by the astronauts through the spaceships and they have recorded them. That means that's a different kind of sound. There's no air there and yet they heard that sound. There is sound everywhere. If you examine this whole universe, there's a sound and sometimes it has been referred to as the music of the spheres. The music of the spheres is the same sound. So when we notice that sound exists everywhere and in meditation you discover that there is a sound that is generating all your experience. It's very interesting. Where does the sound come from? During the teaching of Great Master, he said that the main tool we have to go within ourselves is by listening to the sound. We start by listening to the sound on this entire path of the spiritual journey that we are making. First, we hear a master speaking. If we don't hear him speaking, we don't learn anything. 
this is verbal talk this is talk which can be spoken and recorded and written and therefore it has been called varnatmak shabd that means it is a sound but it is can be varnan that means it can be spoken and it can be written and can be recorded which is being done but this is the first sound if we never heard that sound we could not know anything about the spiritual fact and then we are required to repeat a mantra which is also made up of words another use of varanatmik shabd varanatmik sound so we are using the varanatmik shabd that means a sound that is being used for communicating with us even the basic teaching and without that we won't know anything we are using it for controlling our mind for controlling thoughts it's also the spoken sound so this sound is very interesting but when we withdraw our attention sufficiently behind the eyes in the center center of the head behind the eyes in the center which we sometimes call the third eye center or the single eye that single eye when we put our attention there we find that another sound can be heard in fact several sounds can be heard people have just closed their eyes and sat quietly in a quiet place even with their ears plugged with little ear plugs or with their hand or thumb or fingers they still hear the sounds and those sounds are variety of kind of sounds some sounds are like ringing of bells some sounds are like the cricket chirping some sounds are like birds chirping some sounds are like uh, like a train going on a track some sounds are like a truck going outside those are sounds which have nothing to do with the ears or anything outside where are they coming from we asked some some medical people how do these sounds come they said these sounds come because of the movement of the blood and the lymph in our internal systems when they move you can hear it maybe that is true some of the sounds can be attributed to physical activity of the various fluids in our body and maybe that's a good explanation for some sounds but then if you listen to those sounds you find there are a variety of sounds some look like very close to us some look like they are at a distance and we have a choice to select which sound we want to hear when we begin to differentiate between different sounds we find that a sound that is very similar to the sound of a big bell that we toll on a church that we use in a temple that is very similar to the bomb that a molvi gives in the mosque when you compare those sounds which is like a sound that has a little vibe in it it's got a sine curve in it up and down and sometimes it doesn't have it it's like a continuous whistle blowing or a conch blowing when a when a buddhist monk blows the conch he is referring to the sound which is very similar to the sound inside when we hear bells it's very similar to the sound that sound seems to be a little different from the other sound that we hear the difference is that sound seems to pull our attention from the body which we are trying to do otherwise by the repetition of our symbol by the words that means the sound has a quality to make us vacate our body of its attention and awareness much faster than can be done with our own effort so the sound pulls us it's a very interesting experience to have a sound within yourself that can pull you as if you are being lifted up from the ground and are being pulled into a sky it's of course an internal sky your your ears closed your your eyes closed and you're still being pulled by a sound where does the sound come from it does not come from the right or the left many sounds come from right ear or at least towards the right ear many sounds come from the left ear 
but this sound does not appear to come from any side and appears to be the sound that is coming from somewhere in the center. If you were to examine where that sound is coming from, by carefully listening to it, you'll find it is coming from exactly the third eye center where you are trying to concentrate your attention. That means the sound is coming from your own self. It's an emanation of your own self. That means your self is expressing itself through a sound. It's nobody else. It's your own self telling you I'm here and it's being expressed through a sound. When you listen to the sound, you're going within your own self. So that's why it's a very beautiful and simple way to go within yourself by catching to that sound. Of course, the sound comes when you have used a sufficient of the other means like, med like similar repetition, other techniques of meditation to pull your attention to the third eye center and it is more or less halfway through. Then the sound comes. Other sounds come earlier. You can use the other sounds also to put your attention inside because they are coming from inside. They are not outside. The ears have no role in them. Maybe some of them, the ears may be having a role in it. But since they are happening with your ears closed and you are listening to them, they can still be useful. They have no pull. Those sounds have no pull. But those sounds are heard inside, therefore trying to listen to those sounds which have no pull also withdraws your attention, but slowly at the third eye center within yourself. So that is why I call those sounds practice sounds. They are good for practice. They are good for practicing how to withdraw your attention. But they are not the same sound which pulls you by itself, which is your own self. Your own self pulls you because that's where the attention is being placed. And that is why the sound which is similar to the bell sound or similar to a conch sound, a bell sound, if you listen to it, it may have a frequency of its vibe like dong, dong. As you listen to it, the, the length of the peel becomes longer. Dong. Ultimately, it becomes one. And you can't even know if it's a bell. But it's the same sound. And it, it is because you are reaching the inmost part of the sound, which does not have that up and down frequency in it, it's the same. So that sound pulls you within and that sound has no words in it. It cannot really be even written, cannot be spoken and therefore we differentiate it from the spoken sound of the words we use which were varanatmak shabd, we call that dhon atmak shabd. Dhon atmak means it is a dhon, it's a sound, but it is not that which we use for communication. But it's good enough for withdrawing our attention within. Listening to the sound can take us to a complete withdrawal of the physical body and we can become totally unaware just with that sound. It's wonderful that if you listen to the sound, then when the body is being vacated of its awareness, at a certain point, at about 90% withdrawal, the sound seems to turn into light. That means the light and the sound appear to be the same thing. It's very interesting experience that you can hear the light and see the sound. We, we don't do that normally here, but there it, it's a strange experience which startles us that how can we have that experience? In the Bible it is said, if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be filled with light. It's simply a reference to the ability to concentrate your attention at the single eye, at the third eye center, and it will be filled with the light. There is so much light inside us. It just shines up along with the sound. It's the sound and light are the same. It looks different to us here because it is different. Here, sound travels 
in the air and light travels in space and therefore it is different here but it's the same inside both travel in the inner space and that is why the inner space is very important what happens to the inner space when we have that experience when we have that sound that pulls you to the inner space and we become unaware of our body physical body we find we are in a new place and there is a sky there's an inner sky there just like we have a sky here this sky which we see in the physical plane has different color depending upon whether the sun is up or not at night it is dark and during the day it is bright the inner sky is neither dark nor bright the first inner sky is just like a like an evening sky and you can see in that sky but it's not too sharp so therefore the inner sky is little different from this there is no light and darkness and no day and brightness in that sky it remains the same when you are there that's another different experience as you look at the sky which is different this very sound continues to guide us further if we can listen to that sound now from within our inner self which we have discovered by being unaware of this physical body when we are totally unaware of the physical body it's very easy to use the inner body or listening to the sound at the third eye center of the inner body there is a similar the shape of the inner body is like the physical body sometimes it looks it's slightly bigger sometimes it looks slightly bigger when we first encounter the inner self and want to move around so we are slightly bigger the reason for that is that it is overlapping this physical body the inner eyes are really at the same place as these eyes maybe a little in front and similarly the hands that we have there are right now overlapping these hands and sometimes people say when i bring a hand very close i can feel the hand without even touching it because the feeling is a sense perception is a sensation the sensation can be experienced even from a slight distance a lot of people practicing healing by placing of hands and touching they don't need to touch when they are very close to the skin of the patient they are able to heal with the energy that they are using because of the experience of the inner body being healed at that time and this is a very strange experience but once you know that you can hear another sound inside the inner body when you withdraw your attention within that hear the different sound it's it's not the same sound it is a sound which you enter and feel you have been hearing it all the time these sounds we hear when we start hearing it physical sounds varanatmak shabd you only hear when it is spoken the inner dhonatmak shabd you only hear when you go and listen to it but when you go to the next sound it is as if you have been hearing it all the time it has no beginning no end you were already in it all the time it's a great experience because you are now entering causal stage in the causal stage the sound becomes almost like an experience that you have been hearing it all the time forever forever you have existed you have been hearing the sound but you didn't remember it and you suddenly recall that is why that sound is called unheard shabd unheard shabd means which has no beginning no middle and no end it's only the middle it's no end no beginning so it's continuous infinite sound the experience itself is not of an infinite sound of course people try to imitate the sound is it unheard shabd we can generate through through our vocal cords and i have seen some of the swamis sitting in india telling me how they can generate the unheard shabd they start with a little humming sound and they go on till the breath can hold and they say that and they have started and it's an endless sound that's just a physical sound you can't compare that with the actual unheard shabd the endless sound 
that you actually experience at the causal stage. And this is a very interesting phenomenon that the causal stage is the stage where time is functioning very differently than it's functioning here. Here it appears time is flowing, that we sit here, time is passing, that there was a time before and now it's passed. There you find time is still and you can move on time. That there you discover the reality of time. This, even this time, they are trying to do so many uh, experiments now on space-time, the tin ones, and they are finding <laughs> that space-time is still. The physicists have now found out that the past, present and future coexist at the same time. The physics saying so, not metaphysics. They are saying they all coexist because one person's present can be another person's past and third person's future at the same time. That's what they are finding out now, the nature of space-time. But there you find a reality with your own self. There you find that time was created as a linear event on which you could place other events. So you place the events on time and then you moved along the events and that is why in the physical world you are experiencing time as if one event is moving after another. The sound becomes different the experience of time becomes different and the sky changes. If you look at the sky, it's a beautiful gold orange colored sky. If you have seen a setting sun, when the sun looks bigger, nobody knows why it looks bigger. It should look smaller because it's actually at a great distance. But they're still debating. If you look at Google, you'll find they're still not settled why the sun looks bigger when it's setting. But Apart from the controversy of the size of the sun, you have seen that you can easily see the setting sun. One of the theories is you can see it because you are not really seeing the sun. It has already set and you are seeing its reflection in space. So it looks a little bigger. So, but you can see it clearly. It's golden sky. Half sun, when it's half set, the, if you stretch that sun, setting sun over the entire sky, that's the causal sky which you can experience inside. Many people in their meditation sessions that I hold from time to time, the next, uh, there are few events coming up which we practice this, what I'm talking about. They have seen the golden sky as a glimpse, not having actually withdrawn attention completely from the physical and the astral self, and they have been able to have glimpses of that. But, and it's a beautiful, the whole sky, is like a golden setting sky, and that is the sky in which you hear the an or the shab, which is as if you have been hearing it all the time. But this is only within the three realms of the mind that we can have these experiences. We have not gone into any spiritual realm yet. People who have had these experiences, they think we are making spiritual progress. According to great master, we have not started our spiritual journey. We are just looking at things that can be created and are created by our universal mind and then the individual mind is experiencing at different levels. This is not spirituality. The spirit has still not been discovered. Our soul has still not been discovered. We are still looking at the covers of the soul. This body is a cover on the soul. The sense perceptions or the Astral self is also covered on the soul, and the mind and the time and all is also covered on the soul. The truth is that the spiritual self is beyond that, which I said yesterday can only be accessed by being pulled by the pure love of a perfect living master. I wish I could tell you some other way of crossing the mind and going there. I have not been able to find any, except that they, there should be a pull from beyond the mind. That means the pull of the love should be from somewhere which is beyond the mind. Since we are sitting in the physical world here, how can we find that pull which is so far away with all these other levels between the spiritual self and our physical self? Therefore, it's a great miracle that a human being can appear in our midst 
who is at the time that we talk to him, talking to us from beyond the mind. And that love that comes from such a human being is the pure love that pulls us from all these three stages into our spiritual region. When we are pulled into the spiritual region, the sound is still the same, but it's not the kind of sound we can describe. Attempts have been made to describe these things. I will also attempt to describe these things. The Anhad Shabd, which can be described, which I have just described to you, converts itself into a sound which is a living being. It's your own living self that is the sound. That discovery is made when you cross the mind and you are on your own. That Shabd was the real Shabd. The real Shabd was the one, the real sound was your own self. It was not only emanating from the self, it was the self, and you see the Shabd in that form. And it has also been called Saar Shabd. Saar Shabd means the real Shabd. And they say that you want to know what Shabd is, what sound is, go to Saar Shabd. You discover that's a conscious entity. It's the individuated consciousness of totality, the individuated experience of that which we call the soul. The soul is the Saar Shabd. And that's a great experience. We're still talking of sound. But that is not all. The same sound then ultimately rises. Again with the pull of somebody, something, some entity, some power that should be beyond all individuation and all separation. Something that is in totality. And there is a big gap between our individuated self and our totality. It's such a big gap. It has been represented by a great darkness. We can't describe what the gap is because we are now talking of things which are totally beyond the physical time space. But attempts have been made to draw a picture of what it is like. And the picture is described as a great darkness exists between your discovery of your own self, where each soul emitting a sound and a light of 16 physical suns. And the total light is amazing. The million trillions of suns put together are the light of the sky there. But there's no sky there. We're just representing it in a different way so we can understand it. But what is the big darkness? The darkness is the biggest difficulty of an individual accepting that there is no individuality at all, it's all total, there's only one. The darkness has sometimes been called like a cave. It's called in Indian traditions, Bhavar Gufa. Bhavar Gufa means the revolving cave, that it's a dark cave which revolves and the darkness revolves, which means when you want to go through it with your 16 suns, 16 sun light of your own soul, you can't cross it. If you go into it, and by the time you think you reach the other end, you come out from the same end because of the revolution. Just a way of expressing. It's so difficult to go through it. Now, this requires that you must, own, must be pulled through that darkness by a total power of totality that exists beyond the darkness, which is indeed our true home. Our true home is totality of consciousness. Very few people have come in this world to tell us about their totality and to take us there. Very few people. Great Master used to say, the number of such perfect living masters in human form who are operating from that level of totality can be counted on the fingers of your two hands at any one time, and that's the maximum. There's always one, always one on this planet for such seekers who seek that state. But many people just want to discover the self. The self can be discovered at the stage beyond the creative stage of the mind. The creative stage of the mind has sometimes been called the state of Brahman, and the state above has been called the Parabrahma. 
that means beyond Brahm, beyond the creation of this world. So the power Brahm is the state when we discover our soul and we discover the reality. We discover the immortality of our soul. We discover everything that we have been describing on the spiritual path. Masters who have taken us there are also considered perfect living masters when they've taken us beyond the mind. But they've taken us to a discovery of our soul. They have not taken us through the darkness beyond. And that is why in the North Indian tradition, there was a distinction used in the terminology they used and they called them Saad Gurus. Saad Gurus, that they were real Sadhus who discovered the self. The Saad Gurus took us to Parabrahm and beyond the mind, beyond the three worlds of this mental creation. But the few people who could take us beyond because of our seeking to our true home beyond are called Satgurus, the true ones. Satgurus because they are the ultimate truth. The Sadgurus take us to truth, these are just words I am using, and the Satgurus take us to the ultimate truth. What happens to the Shabd, the sound which you discover, Sar Shabd, the real one? then we term it in the totality as Sat Shabd, the true Shabd. We call that location or our totality as Sat Lok, the true place to be in. Sat Khand, a true home. The truth is that is where we belong. The truth is that this whole thing I'm talking to you about is accessible to each one of us within ourselves. It's not outside. Nothing is outside that I have described. It's all inside us and we can, if we are lucky to have a perfect living master in our life, get all this. Now there is one interesting fact. These perfect living masters who are Satgurus and are operating even as physical human beings from an awareness of totality, of consciousness, are very rare. They do appear in the lives of those who only desire that. But our desires are very mixed up. When we look at what we are wishing for, what we are desiring for, we find that we are mostly desiring for some more comfortable things in our current existence. We are so wedded to this reality of physical existence that our desires are mostly confined to what we can see here what we can get here. Most people, they come to perfect living masters with these desires. Some of them desire to hear the self just to see the radiant form of the master. Some want to see experiences of heaven. Some want to check out if they are really in the jannat, in the heaven, there are hoods, the beautiful women, men desire that. I, I think women must be desiring something similar. But these desires are all confined to the very basic first two stages. And nobody is desiring beyond, nobody is desiring to find out even what is our soul. Nobody is even wondering what the soul is. Most of us are thinking that our thinking machine is the soul. That uh, what, uh, what we are thinking is our own self. And therefore, very few people are really desiring the true home beyond the mind. True home beyond the individuation of the soul. That's very rare. Because that is rare, therefore the perfect living masters who are such gurus and come from totality of soul and are talking to us from totality are very rare. But they appear. They will appear at a time in our life when we are ready and seeking that state. Not many of us are seeking. Some of us seek a state which can be, which can be actually achieved through other masters. There are masters at every level. There are masters who take us within and give us unusual experiences. Within does not necessarily mean third eye center. Within can also mean the various centers that run the body and run our physical universe and physical experiences which are below the eyes. There are at least six acknowledged centers, they call the six chakras. 
starting from the rectum to the genitals to the navel to the heart and the throat and the third eye center. These six centers below also generate very unusual experiences. They can also give out out of body experiences. Many of the yogas are performed according to how we can take advantage of these six lower centers. And these centers do not have the shab that we like to hear about, but we generate a shab. So we have separate mantras for each of these centers. And the yogis who perform these different kind of yogas to have experiences of these lower centers. And by the way, I went to those yogis and I got a lot of experience of these centers too. So I'm not talking from their conversation, talking from what I learned from them by practice. That these centers give you very unusual experiences and you think we have come into another reality. The same experiences can also be had by consuming certain drugs, by consuming various kind of things in, in uh, India. There is a, in the mountain regions, there are some plants growing white and people take those plants and feel they have out of body experiences, very strange experiences. But then when the experience is over, they are back to square one. It does not change their level of anger. It does not change their level of greed. It does not change their level of possessiveness or haughtiness or ego. They are still the same person. These experiences do not alter people, but the inner experiences at the third eye center and above completely transforms us because we begin to view this world differently. With the other experiences, we come out and we are still the same. This is our reality once again. We can't see this as a movie by those experiences. But if you have a reality check on the higher levels within the third eye center and above, you'll find it's very different. I'll tell you a little story of great master. My uncle, my father's elder brother, used to work in a town which is in Pakistan called Karachi. And he was working as a meteorological office, weatherman. He used to predict the weather. He used to send out balloons up there and study what the balloons are saying, at what level they are flying, at what speed. Things like that. That's a nice job he had, but he had a beautiful house on the beach called Clifton Beach. And he, because he had a beautiful house, it was a little distant from the Dera where Great Master lived, but he came to Great Master and invited him to come for a vacation to his beach resort. And Great Master agreed. So many of us traveled with the Great Master, including myself. It was a great experience to go by train. We traveled by train with the great master and we reached there. Now my uncle and aunt used to go to a Swami, his name was Swami Brahmanand. He was a very good yoga teacher and he used to teach the yoga of Raj Yoga, Hatha Yoga and Yoga Patanjali's Yoga of various types. He, he was very expert in teaching yoga of the six chakras of energy. I distinguish these chakras from the chakras that are inside, as chakras of energy, chakras of awareness. Anyway, he was a good, but he was also a very good physician in Ayurveda. He was a very expert Ayurveda guy and he could give Ayurvedic remedies and medicines to people. My uncle and aunt used to go to Swami Brahmanand for getting Ayurvedic treatment, not to learn yoga because they were following the Surt Shabda Yoga of Great Master. When they found Great Master has agreed to come to Karachi to, see, to stay in their house, they decided to invite this yogi to come and meet the Master. So they went to Swami Brahmanand and said, Swamiji, our master is coming from Punjab, from the Dera, and we would very much like you to meet him. So the Swami said, please bring him to me, I will bless him. And this was not what they expected. 
So they decided we have to find some other strategy how to make the Swami meet the great master. So they decided to invite both of them. Great master went and stayed in their house. They decided to invite the Swami also at the same time. And they had a love seat, a little sofa with two seats and put them together. So Swamiji came in his beautiful saffron colored robes and he also had a, a, a saffron kind of a muffler or a scarf which he used to hold with his hands and walk in a very beautiful way, a nice walk, the beautiful eyes he had. I still remember his face even now. And Swamiji came and this made him sit on that sofa and then great master was in his bedroom. They called the great master to come in. The great master came and said, Master, please sit down here next to the Swami. And then they said, Master, this is Swami Brahmananji from whom we get our Ayurvedic medicines and we talk to you about him as Swami Brahmananji. Master folded his hand and bowed like this and Swamiji raised his hand and blessed him. <laughs> I saw this myself and we were a little surprised so this is not what we expected. And then great master said, I am so happy to see you, Swamiji. What a pity it is, he told Swamiji. What a pity that so many Swamis and Yogis are caught up in the six chakras of the physical body and none of them know about the twelve higher chakras. And the true path is to go through all these eighteen chakras. Swami Brahmanan said, Master, I have never heard of any 18 chakras. Where are those 18 chakras? He said, have you not, not heard the five chakra, the six chakra of Pinda, that the physical body. Then there are chakras, six chakras of the Anda, Astral and Brahmanda, and six chakras of Sachkanda. Have you never heard that? He said, Master, I have never heard these new chakras that you are describing. Will you please explain to me in detail where those chakras are and how we can access them? He said, Swamiji, you know this is a very big subject and it's not easy in a few minutes to explain this to you. But if you care to come to my dera, I will certainly explain to you fully. Swamiji said, thank you very much. And lunch was served and Swamiji went his, to his ashram. He could not sleep at night. He said, where are those 18 chakras this bearded, white bearded man was talking about? He didn't even look like a yogi properly. How is he talking of 18 chakras? And somehow he said, I have to go and check it out. And he told his congregation, I am closing the ashram. And I am going to Punjab to a dera where that white bearded man lives and I am going to study those 18 chakras he talked about. If you like to follow me, you can come, otherwise you find some of the yogis to give you teachings in the yoga that I was teaching. And he came to the dera. When he came, great master gave instructions that Swami Brahmananda should be placed in the best suite in the guest house. And there should be attendants attending on his every need of his 24-7. And he will be entitled to see me 24-7, even if it's night and he wants to see me, he can come. And access given to the Swami that was not available to anybody else. VVIP treatment for Swami Brahman. <laughs> Swamiji was very surprised how much he was being cared for. And he began, his gait even improved. <laughs> and he pulled on the muffler even more. I remember this incident. And Swamiji could go anytime. And when Master gave this courses, he said, Swamiji will sit next to me on the stage. So Swamiji began to attend his discourses and sit next to him. After a few days, Swamiji said to great master, Master, when I listen to you, 
Because Master is then saying, this Swami is doing nothing about eating chakra. He's telling people in his hearing. He says, Master, when you talk on the stage, I have to look at you and I have to turn my head all the time. I've got a pain in my neck. <laughs> the master said, I also noticed that. <laughs> Therefore, it is better if you sit in front. So place a chair for Swamiji on the ground. So Swamiji was now moved from the stage to a chair placed in front. After a few days, Swami Brahmanand said, Master, I have a problem. He said, yes, Swamiji, what can I do for you? He said, when I sit, your stage is so high, I have to put my head up like this. I've got a pain in my neck again. The master said, I also noticed it. Please move the chair in somewhere 20, 30 feet further into the crowd. It was sitting there. So the chair was moved. After a few days, Swamiji comes to great master and he says, Master, I have a little problem. He says, yes, Swamiji, what is the problem now? Now the problem is, I am sitting in a chair. People are sitting on the floor. And people behind me can't see. I feel very bad. Oh, I also noticed that. <laughs> Remove the chair. Swamiji was now sitting at the back like anybody else. And he went, given a little hut to live in, away from the VIP status. <laughs> And he was given a small little place to stay there and to practice his Ayurvedic medicine. At that time, I also used to practice homeopathic medicine. And the great master had given me also a little place. We were next to each other. So we used to sit and compare notes sometimes. One day I was sitting with this Swami. He says, this master of yours is a great diplomat. <laughs> if he had treated me now, how I am being treated now, I would have gone back the same day. <laughs> he treated me like VVIP. He gave me, and now he's pushed me back to where everybody else is. I've lost all that status. But he has grabbed me with his love and I can't go anywhere. So this is what has happened. The masters, perfect living masters, do their job in a very different way for each person. They customize. This path is not a general teaching that you people follow. It's customized for each individual. They know where each individual is situated in the path. They know the background from the previous lives of each individual. And they know exactly what is needed by an individual at any particular time. And their own instructions are very different to different people. I have watched that myself. Great Master gave different instructions to different people. Somebody has told me that masters say different things and contradict themselves. I said, they don't contradict. They say the right thing to the right person at the right time. They can say this different thing to the same person. For example, they can tell a person, work hard, do your meditation. And after a few years, they say, forget about meditation. Love and devotion is enough. It's the same person. It's not a contradiction. It is what the requirement of that seeker was at that time. Or they can give different answers based upon the karma of that person. Once a man came, brought his daughter to great master, and he was reading mail and we were sitting together, many of us around him. And the man said, Master, I brought my daughter, she's grown up now, and we want to marry her. They used to have arranged marriages there. And she want to study, go to college. What do you say? Master said, what's the difference between boys and girls? Boys go to college, girls should also go to college, send her to college. He said, thank you, Master. And both of them, the girl was happy, they both went. Within 10 minutes, another man comes with his daughter, same situation. And he says, Master, my daughter is now grown up and we are going to think of marrying her. And she wants to go to college. What is your advice? He said, what a girl should do with college? They should run their home, marry her. I watched this. In 10 minutes, the answer is different because the need, karmic need, for those two girls were different. Masters can see all this. And therefore, this path is not a general teaching. If it was a general teaching, it could be put in a book and anybody could read and follow it. It's customized for each person. The master knows when 
we appear before a perfect living master. He is not looking at our physical body. He is looking at our soul. He is looking at the karma. He is looking how the soul is trapped. How the soul is trapped with the mind and trapped in karmic patterns and has to go through them. He is not bothered whether the karma should be removed or not. He wants to get them out of karma altogether. And his purpose is to take the person out of the mind and therefore out of karma. So when he looks at a person, he is taking a decision based upon the condition of the soul in that body, in that mind of that person. So he can give very different answers to different people. So when I came to the United States first time, somebody said, there is a book which there are a lot of contradictions. And there are, and that book which is called Spiritual Gems, the letters written by great master to his disciples overseas, mostly Americans at that time. And I'm very happy that there is, we have amongst us a friend sitting in the audience. He is a professor in Chinese. He has translated spiritual gems into Chinese. And many people are reading that book and taking benefit. When they pointed out to me, letter number so and so, master says this, letter number so and so, he almost contradicts himself. I had to explain to them, neither letter number one nor letter number two was meant for you. They were meant for those people to whom they were written. As you are taking that book as if it's teaching for everybody. You may get some information, useful information about the path from the book. But don't think that the letter written in a particular letter is exactly meant for you. It was meant for the person to him it was written. That is why these, these apparent contradictions can exist. They also told me, you are telling me, you are telling us about the importance of sitting at the third eye center. You are telling us that you have to imagine that you are sitting there and all that stuff. We don't find it in spiritual gems. I said, I have never read it. I have never read the book, by the way. Can I give you a copy? I'll read it. I read the copy first time in this country. When I read through it, overnight I read it. And I marked 16 places where the same thing was being mentioned. People read a book and don't read what is written in it. So th that is why our mind is so created that we like to hear what we like to hear. We like to read what we like to read. There was a friend of mine who came to Boston, met me there. He said, somebody gave me a book called The Path of the Masters by a doctor called Dr. Julian Johnson. Useless book. I said, why? All oh, stuff that he picked up from India, all those notions that Indian swamis and yogis have. Useless book. I threw it away. I said, very good. Now you find some better books. After six years, he comes again to see me. And he says, I found the truth. I said, where did you find it from? The path of the masters. <laughs> same book. It was the same book he read earlier. It was useless. Now suddenly it become all right. The book did not change. But his reading changed. His, his understanding changed. His accepting what was written there changed. Now, People come to me and I give a general talk, like I'm giving now. now. If you were to ask people, what did I say at the end of the talk, they'll give different pictures. People hear what they, they hear at that time and they don't hear the same thing. Nor do they hear the same thing if they hear it later on the same talk. So we, this is the mind, the mind accepts what it wants to accept. Now, when a person asks me a question, and people ask questions all the time, during the interviews, during emails they write to me, they ask questions. If I gave an answer, which is true answer, but not what the person wants, he won't accept it. But if I gave an answer, yeah, that's right, then the answer is correct. The reason for that is that the answer is there in the mind before the question is asked, and we don't know about it. You cannot formulate a question if the answer is already not with you. And what happens is you are unaware of the answer because sitting inside you, in that part of your mind, 
which is not open at that time, you make it a question. And when the answer comes and suits that, when the answer given by an outside person and suits the answer inside, you say, that's right, I accept it, good answer. If I gave a foolish answer, that doesn't make sense. So it's not that you accept any answer somebody gives, it's that already your mind is conditioned to accept which answer you will accept and which you will not. My wife once said to me, these people who come to hear you, I don't know why they come again and again. <laughs> you say the same things. <coughs> I'm tired of hearing the same things. <laughs> That's why I don't want to come there to hear you anymore. <laughs> and then she said, I am going to test out what they come to see you for. So when we have our meetings in Bruce, Wisconsin, at Rice Lake, she would invite a group of seven or eight people for dinner. And during serving of dinner, she would say, how was my husband's talk today? And they would say, wonderful, very good. Then say, what did he say? <laughs> Nobody would answer. <laughs> she said, they have not come to listen to you. They come for social activity. They come for dating and mating. <laughs> they come for food. But not to listen to you. You are under the impression they come to listen to you. I learned a big lesson from my wife. I didn't tell her, but I can tell you that if after learning this lesson, why am I talking to you again? The reason is, I am not talking to you for you. I am talking to you for myself. I am talking as a seva to my master. Only. It is a great privilege, I think the greatest privilege, to get an opportunity to do service to a master, perfect living master. I had that opportunity when I was a child. I can't forget it. Simple seva. There was no electric power there, and when master sat in the summer, there was a big fan. The people used to fan the master. One day I said, I want to fan but I was the same size as the fan. <laughs> and I said, Master, can I hold the fan for you? And the Sevadar said, he's too small. Master said, give him the fan. I remember, still, I took the fan and I fanned him. That Seva was no different than the Seva I'm doing today. Seva cannot be differentiated by what the action is. The seva is that you get a chance to express your love and emotion for somebody who's pulling you with that love. And any seva is wonderful. And there's also one other reason which I'll tell you. It's a confidential reason. Keep it confidential. <laughs> if you feel like telling somebody else, tell them also to keep it confidential. <laughs> and the confidential reason is, great master said, that if you do seva with love and devotion, it's equal to meditation with love and devotion. And that's a big shortcut. So I found a big shortcut and I'm sharing it with you. So that's why I've always given great importance to the seva that we do. And if we do seva without expecting a reward, but out of pure love and devotion for the love we are receiving, you don't need anything else. You will see how quickly your attention is withdrawn to the beloved who is sitting inside you. The love and devotion is a very strange thing. It's an experience where you are being pulled to your thinking all the time. You can't think of anything else. You're thinking of your master all the time. And Seva heightens that experience of being with the master. And you see his image. You see him all the time. It's like the third part of meditation, which we say the first part is the repetition of words, according to Great Master teaching, practice of Sutsya Yoga requires first the Shabd, which is repeated in Simran, second, listening to the sound, third is Dhyan. Dhyan means contemplation of the face of the Master. But if you are doing Seva of any kind, of the Master or his disciples, you are thinking of the Master all the time and it pulls your attention faster your meditation becomes more effective.
this was a good good lesson i learned and that is why in spite of my wife's good advice to me i still talk to you <laughs> and this is uh, because of seva and he is the power who is doing everything people say will you initiate me and i say don't initiate anybody that's the truth i don't initiate anybody but a visible a great master with me initiates it's an experience to see the great master can still initiate you can't see because he's dead physically dead but the power the master power that initiates is great master's power that is why people say i want to come to bandara will you initiate me i said i don't know come to bandara and at that time when you're sitting next to me i ask great master is he the candidate you are looking for is he the one you have marked as a marked soul if yes you are initiated if no sorry so that is why all the work i am doing i must tell you the credit goes entirely to my master great master zul maharaj baba sawar singh whose bandara we are celebrating here and whose blessings i can visibly see going to people who attend this bandara it just an experience i am having so that's why i'm very happy that i can share this experience with you and share so much of the great master's love with you if you feel the pull of love an ordinary person like me can't do anything about it i have nothing to do with that experience you have it's internal experience of yours but the power that you see coming from the great master that is why it is so important for me to explain great master's teachings i do not go even a little bit away from his teachings because people question me if another master who says he is following the teaching of great master say something else then what you are say what do you what comment i have no comment i can talk about no other master i cannot talk about the teaching of any other master except great master azur maharaj baba sawan singh ji because his method his teaching his love worked on me it did not work i would not be sitting here talking to you it worked on me and therefore i share with you i do not go even a slightly away from that to put my own mental ideas into it some people do if that's their business is not mine i want to stick completely to what great master teaching was what he did and stay within it and that is why i do not want to go even beyond my own experience with great master everything i say to you here is verified by my experience not some other people's experience i have not read many books people quote books when they come to me and i say i may not have read it if you want me to read it i'll read it and then i can make a comment on the book if i can i won't make a comment i'm not a book reader i don't like to read too many books but some people like to read books now there was a man who came he told great master master i've read all the books on the spiritual path of every kind of even not only your teaching every teaching i've studied he said that's very good you are very qualified person you are highly qualified person and you should come and meditate with me after he meditated he said master what shall i do with the books he said throw them into the river <laughs> the same books which are so good and no good i will now conclude this by telling a personal story of my grandmother uh, this is because it's very touching story my mother's mother maternal grandmother she was a great believer in the idols and deities they make of gods and goddesses in the hindu tradition and she had a temple in her house in which she had put little stone and metal images that this is brahma this is vishnu this is shiva this is the goddess durga all kinds of gods and goddesses she had and she would have a little bell ring and do prayers for the aarti 
and perform all those things which ritualistically we all in India perform in temples and so on. And many people have a temple like that in their house and she believed in those gods and goddesses. When my dad got married to my mother, he found his mother-in-law is doing those things and he was already initiated by great master. So he went to her and said, mother, this is not correct what you are doing. These are just images. They are not real. This is the real reality is inside you. She says, forget it. Get out of my house. <laughs> you are insulting my gods and goddesses. What kind of son-in-law are you? His efforts failed. Every time he tried to convince her, he went and told great master. Great master said, no, don't try to convince her. She believes in something. Let her believe it. What's the problem? I'll go and see her. He said, you will go and see her. That's been wonderful. So he told his mother-in-law, he said, my master wants to come and see you. That's great. So great master went to the house of my mother, of my grandmother, my father's mother-in-law and said, I understand you have a temple here. She said, yes, master, I have a temple and all the gods and goddesses are there. He says, can I also go and look at your gods and goddesses? Certainly. So the great master goes, bows head to the gods and goddesses and rings the bell and performs the prayer. Mother-in-law, my father is so happy and my father is so disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening here? Great Master started worshipping the same things. He was telling us, don't worship. So, my uh, grandmother was so happy. He said, see, told uh, my father, you knew nothing about your master. <laughs> he is the real master. I am going to hear his discourses. <laughs> And she began to come and hear his discourses and got initiated and began to do regular meditation. After a year or so, she said, Master, you know, you saw all those gods and goddesses sitting in my temple in the house. What shall I do with them? He said, do you have a, that big brown bag in which we get wheat, a gunny bag? She said, yes, I have. Pack them with that gunny bag and tie it up and throw it to the river <laughs> and she did exactly that. Now it looked very strange to people that great master should be doing something so odd but he knew what the lady wanted. She knew how the lady is a marked soul, is a seeker, is seeking in a certain direction but at the right time she will come on the path which she was teaching. There are so many people the United States is full of people who are following so many different traditions and they are all seeking the truth and they don't know where to go ultimately. And that is why Great Master predicted that this axis of spirituality will move in a very big way, the United States. Actually, I came to this country. I was offered two big jobs in India, governorship of a state after I retired from my job and a member of a planning commission, a cabinet post. I declined them to come and work with two black guys here to make cookies. <laughs> There's no comparison between the jobs. Why did I come here? I came to take a ringside seat on the show that's happening because I knew that great show of spirituality is going to take place here and that's why I came. And I am watching that show right now. It's taking place. Thank you very much for joining me today and I'll see you, uh, today am I seeing you again? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay, before I leave, I am uh, told that there are a few questions from the audience I might take up now. Dear Ishwar Puriji, you have always spoken about people changing real meditation of listening to sound current into a religious practice. You've stressed on how people start with good intentions and then later make groups, buildings, coasts, <clears throat> and then it all becomes asking donation for building a church temple. Why serve now 
Zane is starting with Isha and asking to make a building, donating for construction, making our own Isha place, etc. Isn't the whole world made by God our place? Why we need to make a building and start the same as other religions? If you look at all religions of the world, they all started with pure spirituality. They all talked of the South. They all talked of the world made flesh, the world pulling us within. In Hinduism, they say the Shabd is the entire creative power. In the Rig Veda, the Nard, the sound says it's created everything. It almost looks like a Sanskrit translation of the first few verses of John's Gospel in the Bible, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him, and nothing was made that was not made by Him. Opening verses, same thing in Hinduism, same thing in Islam. This is Bangladesh Asmani, and it says that it's a religion not for Muslims, religion for the whole world. It says it's not Rabbi Muslimin, it's Rabbi Alameen. That means it's for everybody, but we made it into a religion. Christianity became a small religion. The Hinduism became a religion. Every great, perfect master who came and gave a message, we converted into religion. Great master said to me, in his own time, they started making it into a religion. And we who are assembled here, I can tell you today, this will also be a religion one day. We make spiritual teaching into religion when we don't practice, and we take politics into our spiritual organizations. Organization comes because of the increase in the number of people who come to masters. As the number increases, politics starts and power games start and more emphasis is placed on what rituals can be observed physically over here and the truth about the inside is forgotten. So that is how we take what is inside us, what is the truth and make it outside. We, I don't want to make a religion, it will become a religion. I can predict it for you. By the very nature, it's always happened. And that is why when we say we are building a building, it's for only for logistical reasons. The building is not supposed to be for any other reason. A building was built by great master in India. They still call it Satsang Ghar. Today people calling it Saj Khand. They think the building is the truth and that's where they can go into the building. This happens every time. So the building is, is a good thing, so we don't have to search for Hilton hotels and all that. <laughs> we can meet comfortably. We can talk in a place where we know we have only logistical reason not to make it into a temple. But no matter what building you will make, one day it can be turned into a place of worship and become a temple. And a new religion can be born. That's how all religions have come into being. And I have studied at Harvard University. I did not go there to study religion. I went to study economics, business, think, develop, economic development, things like that. I even got a fellowship for that. But I studied comparative religion of 11 religions. And I found all religions came the same way. And they became religions because the spirituality was being converted into rituals and ceremonies which can be done outside. And those became more important than the fundamental teachings. I saw that. I thought maybe there will be something common in all religions. Maybe love and devotion, maybe something else. I didn't find that. What I found was every religion said, this is the only true one, all others are false. <laughs> only common thing. That is how we divide. Spirituality unites. Do you know how many religions are represented in this crowd? Almost all religions are sitting right here. Do you know how many different masters, disciples are sitting here? I know they meet me. There are all so many masters, disciples sitting here. It's not particular one master who, who, who is the only master who teaches. They don't need one religion that teaches spirituality. Spirituality 
exists, the spiritual truth exists in every human being. Every human being has the same thing inside him as a perfect living master has. There's no difference. And that is why perfect living masters come wherever they are seekers. And later on, it becomes religion. I have no intention to create a building which will be worshipped. Building only for helping. Hotels are not that good as a building. That's, that's why we need a building, just for accommodating. But the very building that was built in the Dera of Great Master on the bank of the river Bias, that today is being used as a place of pilgrimage. And you can go to building and just because there were some minarets on the side of the building, people say if you can climb on those, you go to the astral stage, the causal stage, and there is a sun. <laughs> in the building, physical building. And so meant only, I had a I had a roll, I carried a brick on my head in the building. My, one of my bricks, my, many of my bricks must be in that building. Of course, I could only carry one, I was so small. There was another guy with me, a, a Mastana, intoxicated guy from Baluchistan. They called them Mastana, great master called them Mastana, which means intoxicated one. He carried a basket. He carried a basket of bricks and I carried one. We both used to walk together and we used to discuss spiritual experiences. And he would discuss, I have had wonderful walks with some people, Her Mastana was one. He said, do we have to learn new languages all the time? Because this language fails inside in his experiences, things like that. Wonderful experiences. The other walk I used to have with Julian Johnson, because he liked me because I could speak a little English. And I was still very small, but we shared so many experiences that we were having. Some of the things he told me was some of the most fundamental beliefs that came to me. He used to come, Julian Johnson, he was, he was a doctor from here. And he learned about Great Master when he was a missionary in Calcutta, in India, converting people to Christianity. That was his job as a missionary in India. There were a lot of missionaries there, he was one of them. He heard from two people in the United States who were disciples of Great Master, Mr. and Mrs. Brock, that go and see that white bearded man who lives on the banks of the river Bias and gave him an address. So he wrote to the Great Master, Master, I want to come and see you. My friends have recommended I see you. And my friends say that you are a perfect master and I can find real salvation through you. I want to come and see you. Great Master said, you are most welcome. At that time, there were no planes flying, so he said, take a train and you can stop. The train does not stop at the station where the Dera is. You can stop 20 miles earlier at a station called Jalanda, or you can stop 20 miles later, 30 miles later at a station called Amritsar. And we will send a car. If you stop at Jalanda, there's an attorney named Bhagat Singh, he lives very close to the railroad, railroad station and he'll pick you up. It's better to come to Jalandhar. So he will be able to recognize you because not too many white Americans travel here. He'll be able to recognize you and he'll bring you to see me in the Dera. Julian Johnson traveled by the train and meantime, what did Great Master do? Great Master told Bhagat Singh, let's play a little game on this guy. <laughs> Master do that also? People have no idea what Masters can do. <laughs> he said, I will go and hide in your house. And when Julian Johnson will get down, he will say, let's go to the Dera to meet the Master. You tell him, what's the hurry? Let's go home and have a cup of tea first he will be irritated with you. He said all this in advance. He'll be irritated with you, will not like to go to your house. Persuade him, no, no, it's your long journey, you are very tired, you come. And then you bring him to your house and then say, Dr. Julian Johnson, I have a surprise for you. And then you bring him and I'll see him sitting in your living room. That's exactly what happened. Julian Johnson got down and uh, Bhagat Singh recognized him, tall white man and he said, you're Dr. Johnson? Yes. 
oh, you had a long journey, it's taken two, three days on the train, so let's go home. My home is not too far from here, near the railroad station, and we'll have some tea or something, and you refresh yourself, and then we'll go and see the master. He said, no, I'm not come for tea or something. Please uh, forgive me for that. I want to go and meet master. I've come only to see him. He said, no, 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 you know, you are, it's a wrong journey. You should come to my house. I'll take you to my house. He got irritated and got angry. No, no, but why are you trying to insist on this? He said, no, because it's a long journey. I, I feel you need it. So he brought him to his house. An irritated man, little angry. And he says, Dr. Johnson, I have a surprise for you. And takes him to the living room and there's great master sitting on a chair. Julian Johnson writes to his friends after that meeting. He says, that was the biggest surprise in my life, to see that man. I could not speak when I saw him. I, I was going to sit on his feet. He said, no, take a chair. I sat there speechless. And what I got from him, he wrote in his letter, what I got from him in these few hours, he wrote the letter the same night, typed it on his typewriter that he carried. What I got from him in this couple of hours that I spent with him is enough for me to say my journey was successful, even if I get nothing more. That's what he wrote. Just by having that experience of being near great master. After that, of course, he meditated so much, he found out that there were some sadhus. Sadhus mean those who are 100% involved in spiritual activity. So great master had set up a separate camp for them in the Dera. And they, many of them, had dug little quick caves, uh, small caves in the bluff of the river, Vyas. And they would meditate in the caves. He said that must be a good place. So he dug his own cave for meditation. And it was beautiful. It was much better done than the other cave. They were just not finished completely. He made nice cave. He put a door also, wooden door outside, and would lock it also. Also gave me the opportunity sometime to meditate there, for which I am grateful to him. And he meditated for eight hours, meditated for long periods, had great experiences. And he could share those experiences with the permission of his master. And we talked about his experiences, how he saw his past lives, for example. He saw one after the other. He saw him as a cave, uh, right up to cave man, and how he mistreated the son of his whom he was going to throw into a well that time, and how that reacted to some other event that happened. He was amazed to see all this, and he would share those things. He used to tell great master, master, my friend is in trouble in the United States, in Kentucky or some place, and he's having a problem. Will you please help him? Master would say, I will talk to my master. I pray to him to help your friend. He would say, somebody is sick there, can you please help master? He would say, I pray to Baba Jamal Singh to help your friend there in this health. After a couple of years, he is telling me on one of the walks, I have been so stupid to ask these things. I did not realize that this karma of high and low, of sickness and health, this karma of poverty and riches, this karma of being very happy and sad is a great gift to us. That if this karma was not with this ups and downs, we would never be human beings and never have a chance to meet a perfect living master. I have stopped making any request to great master for anybody's help after that. Because this is a platter of a goodies given to us where the karma is good and bad. Without that, if we, karma was all good, we're sitting in an astral heaven. If karma was totally bad, we'd be sitting in a hell there. It's only when there's a mixture of the two that we become human beings. It's a great gift to us. That particular lesson has been in my mind ever since. And I found that this is the best part of life to have the ups and downs, otherwise we wouldn't have had a chance to meet the Master even. We couldn't have been a seeker at all if we didn't have this opportunity. Seeking is only possible when we are ignorant. If we knew our future, we would never be able to seek. Only we are ignorant what will happen in the future that we seek and we hope and we make all those things. 
seeking is from the soul, desire from the mind. But they all take place because of our ignorance. Ignorance is bliss in a true sense here. And that is why the human life comes only with that. Julian Johnson taught me that. I'm only remembering my nice walks there. And then the cave, Julian's cave became very popular, but he kept it locked. And later on he said, what meditation? When the master pulls you with love, you need nothing else. He was right. Thank you very much.